Okay, again, welcome to Village Board, Village of Red Hook Workshop meeting, January 7, 2021. Um, I do, from my participant list, see we have a quorum, but just since we are in virtual meeting format, I would like to confirm who's out there. I'll say myself as Blundell. Brent, are you there, sir? Yeah. And Jennifer Norris? Yes. Uh, Mr. Charlie Lang? I am here. And Will Noonan? Will Dunin, are you there? I see the yes. mouth moving and I see his face. Are you back? Can we hear you, Will? I think you can. Okay, yeah. So we have all the board here and recording and acting as clerk of the meeting tonight will be Lara Hart, who is also remote. And as you can see, we're recording. Just to remind everybody, it is a formal meeting of the village. It's been noticed to the media on our website and different postings. Um, we did circulate agenda to the board and it's, um, we have tonight some stakeholders as part of the project. I'll talk more about it in a moment. But um, what I want to introduce the board and to the, the new people out there joining us on a meeting like this, a workshop meeting, our goal is, even though it is formal, we view it more as an idea session, the word workshop is self-defining. It's something where we can talk ideas and concepts and push a project along. Tonight, we're really, really just going to center on police reform and redesign. Uh, if you look in the agenda, there's an ancillary piece that could dovetail in periodically is our budget, since almost everything we do comes with some price and so forth. But I don't envision us deciding a budget line item tonight or a final outcome tonight. Um, those of us that meet in workshop fashion often know we usually meet around a table, around the table. And that's the concept I'd like to promote tonight. It's, we all have ideas. We want to get through certain subject matter, but at the same time, we'll want to keep the free flow of ideas going. Uh, we, do, we do keep Excuse some of the core and the rules. Bless you. Thank you. Sorry. We don't go strictly by Robert's rules, but we like to, f we work as colleagues and anybody joining us, we consider a colleague in the same fashion. We uh, respect each other. We work together. We would use, I would say, parliamentary rules. The mayor essentially is host slash can run the meeting as far as acknowledging the public and so forth. What I did envision tonight is we'd go through a booklet here that we've been all studying and then as we work, the core group would be the village board members and the stakeholder group who are specifically uh, provided with a book. And then there's regular public that I see look like might be out there as well. Um, they can talk at the public comment section. But uh, with that being said, that's the rules, the road for the workshop type meeting. One of my other rules is we don't like to go much more than an hour and 45, two hours, because then things become sometimes counterproductive. Um, I'm not sure we'll have to go that long tonight. We do have our regular monthly board meeting on January 11, I believe the date is coming Monday, and then another workshop set for 21 January. Uh, we will certainly do more workshops. <coughs> and we're working against, um, in this particular project of police reform and redesign, uh, the state has given us April 1, 2021, where we have to send our design off to the New York State Department of Budget, and um, so we have deadlines and goals, and uh, we'll start into it. As far as um, our perspective, the board here, uh, when Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 203, um, we started work with Dutchess County and the Police Reform Collaborative. For those who may or may not know, that was um, a composite of any municipalities that had a police department within their purview. Not everybody in Dutchess County has that, but we do. So we started right away and we had multiple meetings. Patrick Hildebrand is our sergeant and our lead manager in our police unit. Um, and he and I were on many meetings. Some were also held within the confines of the Chief of Police Association for the county. Um, the police provided their expertise and then a countywide stakeholders group was formed uh, you'll see their input in the book we're going to go through, too. That was um, included all aspects of the county and a lot of what I'll call down county 
uh, entities and organizations we're in that, whereas our stakeholder group is more focused on our circle up here in Northern Dutchess County. Um, but as far as our role here in local government, since we do have a police agency, we are obligated and it's the right thing to do as well to redesign wherever we think it might be needed based on input and what we see going on on the national scene and so forth. Um, and as always, the village board and the mayor's task and the village government's task, including our police department, is to protect the health and safety of our residents. And um, that's the underlying goal for all of us and to keep that going. And we all also talk more detail as we get into it, but we believe we have a very smart and a very modern police force, but we're always willing to retool, redesign, modernize further if we can. And um, with that being said, we can move into a few. I thought what we'd do is work together on the actual booklet itself. I don't really feel like putting up on my screens. I, I hope everybody has it somewhere in their physical proximity. Um, the board had the benefit of two draft versions as I was getting uh, pr provided with draft versions over the preceding months. And the one that we made into the ring bind, uh, the bound volume is the final version of the collaborative project. Uh, my knowledge, each of the stakeholders has that. I don't, I see some names I don't necessarily recognize as members of the public, but they would not have the benefit of the book. It is available in a different online formats, but it's about 110 pages long. Nobody's going to read it tonight as we're sitting here going over. But the reason I pointed out is the board and myself and the stakeholders have had the benefit of being able to read the book for quite some time. And just looking through participants here, you do see one of the stakeholders. We have Mel Korka, um, Carswell, and Let's see, I think that's the actual only formal stakeholder on here that we asked to join tonight. Um, another stakeholder is Kahan Sablo from Bard College, Dean of Inclusion. And then we have, let's see, um, we asked Kim McGrath Gomez to be on here too. She has a book. She's an administrative official at the local chamber of commerce. And we have a few others, but I don't see. Oh, I just see Khan is on there now. So welcome, stakeholders. And um, I'd like to get going. I guess based on the format, I could keep the talking going. Um, and then, um, like I said, if people, if you just want to interject stakeholders, if you want to stop us, we will, we will not consider that an interruption. Uh, but I want to just start going highlighting. If, if people could go to page 26 and 27 of the book. Um, in my opinion, that those couple of pages break down a lot of the input from community forums, from the collaborative and the work that the local police agency have done together and phone calls all through the past two or three months. Um, folks might remember, to my, to my mind here locally, we've had the September 26th community forum, which covered the Northern Dutchess area. you haven't been operating. I'm fine. Okay. I need your help. If the O'Connors could mute their phone or mute their themselves. Um, so we've had the benefit of the Northern Dutchess Community Forum, and then we, many of us participated or watched the Tivoli Forum, which was early, like almost pre-summer, I think. Um, and then um, in the booklet, you'll see countywide, there were five or six specialized, localized community forums and that helped develop some aspect of the new input. But what I had done from the various forums I listened to was, type down keywords in almost a spreadsheet format, even before this collaborative book came out. And our village board was discussing those words and those concepts, again, even before this book came out. The good part is, in my mind anyway, they seem to condense, and this book brings many of the ones we identified by listening to the forums, uh, condenses them into black and white in front of us. 
so what I thought I'd do is not to be too boring, but on page 26, um, there's a section called themes and priorities. And um, then there's a section to, through group discussions and submissions highlighted some key, the group discussions and submissions highlighted some key priorities. One was require law enforcement officers in Dutchess County to wear body worn cameras, create clear policies to require their operation and set guidelines for the release of footage. So if we could check that in our minds. Number two, increase the number of positive non-enforcement contacts law enforcement officers have with residents in their community, improving community relations and expanding their involvement in the community events and activities. To give a few examples, sports leagues, nonprofit programs, et cetera. Um, another one, increase transparency regarding use of force incidents and public and publish and collect data on such incidents such as traffic stops arrest searches including demographic data of the individual involved another was require agencies to adopt internal and external procedural justice as their guiding principle um, i'm going to skip over the other page increase the diversity of law enforcement workforce and some of these, I think, repeat some of the prior bullets. Um, another one I checked was ensuring that the efficacy of training is evaluated routinely and that experiential and scenario-based training are utilized whenever possible. So what I felt, because in this page, what I thought our village should try to do is identify five or six concepts or ideas that we think we should think we further adopt. Further adopt. Um, um, but I mean, start to consider what our plan will be. And this development of a plan is going to be multiple steps, like I said. Um, and in the end, the plan does require what's known as a public hearing, which is where we publish and actually conduct community-wide public hearing, um, which should be, I'm thinking, maybe later on tonight or after our 21 January meeting, we'll actually firm up that schedule when that's all going to happen. But um, what we were doing, the village, I would like to say, is a solutions business solutions or a solutions, business operation. solutions operation. When we were looking at the earlier calls and the earlier forums and so forth. We've already started action on some of these. And on the call today, we have, or the, on the meeting today, we have our sergeant um, who, like I said, runs our department. He can fill in some details. But those who follow our regular meetings will know that we've already made our own independent steps with some financial assistance from the town of Red Hook to purchase and start using body-worn cameras. We think it helps both the general public and the officers. Um, we have the sergeant working on policy manual insert, and let's say we got that 95% done. Um, I think that's a huge proactive step, and we're not gonna wait around for that, yet, but that'll be part of our one of our submissions that will be part of our plan. The other thing, as far as procedural justice, that was another bullet point there. Um, we have, and Sergeant can fill us in a little more if we need it, but uh, we have moved to um, certain of our officers were set for December classes, December classes and, COVID, and certain challenging things happened where we couldn't get everybody through, but we have some train to trainer work done, this is my position, but it's something we're certainly gonna work on. Um, but I thought what I'd like to do is possibly, possibly by the end of tonight, the, end of the board and the input from others, look at, look at further our identifying four, five or six things that we can work on that are budget um, comfortable. And uh, by that, I mean things we can afford to do. And, so, um, so Ed, I, I have a question here on the one bullet point where it says increased transparency the use of force incidents and collect published data on such incidents. We do publish a list. Is that made? Is that made available to the public? I mean, there's no address listed or names listed. It just gives you streets, I guess. And yeah, I, I brought one. Um, again, the board's familiar with it. Uh, let me describe what it is for people, and then we can talk more. For instance, at our January meeting, we already the board will have in their meeting packets the December Police Department activity report. 
Um, it essentially gives the number of incidents reported. I think it's worth bringing up tonight. Um, number of traffic tickets issued and number of arrests. And quite frankly, they, if one were to graph these numbers, they're pretty standard month to month to month. Uh, it's not, we don't see a good month, a bad month. Uh, it seems the number of cars going through, the number of incidents, you know, they dance around the same um, numbers. But just for people to get some sort of fact pattern, the incidents are 375. Now these are not, these are really all complaints called into the police through 911 or anything. It's, um, this could be security checks. This could be various lower level tasks with things they are spending time on. And we break it out just for the public to know too, we do contract time from our police department to the town of Red Hook and to the school through the SRO officer program. And you will see in the book, SRO, the concept comes into various forms of favor and disfavor uh, in community forums. Uh, but for the month of December, there were 375 incidents. We issued 79 traffic tickets and there were eight arrests. Um, <clears throat> I guess what I'm asking that is that behind that report, that's the summary of all the incidences that had happened. But behind that, the, the backup data includes what specific things and how many calls that the police got and the responses. And it does give a demographic exit area of where we looked at, you know, being be it the town, the village, or Tivoli. And that's pretty informative. When I go through there, I see how many foot patrols we have in the village, how many, you know, searching, and you know, all kinds of incidents are reported there. And I don't know if that bullet point that I was referring to in this book mm -hmm. includes something similar to what we have already published. And the question remains is, is this available to the public outside the report? You know, that fifth page word. The thing is, although people are, there are no names or specific addresses, well, up till now it's been provided to the village board which in a sense acts as a version of a police commission. It's not formal in Villa's law anywhere, but just looking at it, like for instance, there's some domestic dispute complaints. Um, if somebody were to really hunt, they might be able to figure out what's going on here. Um, um, but Brent, I think we could take that. What we do at every board meeting, we, we state, the gross numbers. Um, I think there's two levels. I think in the V and T polls, that's it's definitely not defined in this as far as um, say race or nationality or whatever of people that are being pulled over by the police. That's it's not to that depth of detail here in this. Um, and I don't know of any any report that would have that. But I think Brent. It's something to consider. Where were you looking at that on, um, which bullet point was that, Brent? Was that, um, it was uh, on the, the group through discussion and submission highlights and key, key priorities. It would be the third bullet point yeah. of the group discussion. Mm -hmm. But what's the, what's the question, Ed? The uh, question how is, is, how much, you know how we get the top sheet and then yeah. you know, the supporting document pages behind yeah. it? Um, how much detail could be released without too much specific detail where parties could be identified, you know, it's, um, no, if, if, if someone, you know, if, if a neutral person foils, a, we'll say Brent, for instance, we had a police report at your house and you had uh, hypothetically, there was a domestic there and some random person off the street comes in and foil requests your information and they're not a party to the incident. It doesn't get approved. Um, you know, I deny it. And if for some reason, you know, a uh, foil does go out, any of that information is redacted out of the report because people aren't entitled to your personal information. What happened at your house? If, if some random person just comes off the street and starts foil requesting, you know, you're not entitled to people's personal information. Maybe they had a domestic, maybe there's a child abuse case, uh, maybe there's a sexual assault. People aren't entitled uh, to other people's in personal information like that. You have to fill out a FOIL and you would uh, give your reasons why. If you're not a direct party to it, 
it would either you know get approved or denied. But majority of the time, it's going to get denied because you, you're you're not a party to the action. So the information that that you provide for at backup on the on the police report itself, yeah. they don't list names. They don't list addresses either. It calls for service. They list a specific calls that you go on. Right. You know. Those are calls for service that are, um, are, those, are, those, are those to be um, can those be made public or should they just for our information only? No, I mean they, they should I mean it's not uh, go ahead Ed. I, I would say in this format they couldn't be released. I, um, I agree. Because you're giving okay. personal you're giving personal addresses. It names and that, that was a question I was trying to get an answer to. It doesn't give <laughs> Street Sorry, number, but their streets named and yeah. Um, All right, um, just just asking. Some of them are, you know. And, you know, and the biggest thing says honestly, erratic is, vehicle. But and the biggest thing honestly is like domestic violence, right? So um, I work closely with um, the domestic violence, and it's obviously uh, a big thing that's just county, big thing across the state. So you have to protect, you have to protect those parties who potentially is a victim of domestic violence, and if that's open to the public. Now somebody who might not have known your address can put it together and know where you are now. So, you know, that wouldn't be uh, accessible. Understood. Yeah. But it goes, I guess, yeah, we might as well be upfront. The national desire and the state desire and locally is, we saw in the spring and over the years and decades too, incidents where racial bias is a factor. So a lot of what's happening here is um, in New York is designed to how do we mitigate, reduce, eradicate that underlying bias that's apparently driving some of these ugly incidents. So, um, so what we're doing is we never want that to happen in Red Hook and we currently are hiring processes, certain things we do, which we can talk about, um, we try to protect against that. But one of the main thrusts of this whole project is to get better at that. And, and nobody's ever pointing a finger, at least to my knowledge, at, at any one incident or effort or error by um, a Red Hook police officer. Um, we're looking at the national scenario, the local forums, countywide, and the specifically local <coughs> forums. And um, you know, we have internal ways to to work on things right now. We just want to get smarter, better, and deal with things. I think I might have heard Khan Sablo clear his throat. Khan, did you want to say something? Yes. Um, where is that demographic information kept relative to ethnicity of those that are having an encounter with law enforcement? Um, I recently spoiled with the Kingston police and the uh, results were a little concerning in that the, the, uh, the disproportionate arrests of men of color, the under arresting of white women, which unless you went looking for it, you wouldn't find it. So I, I'm not sure how or if that data is being collected, but to me, that's where the devil is in the details and it's asset, accessing that information so that real questions can be asked. I will speak candidly as there are, obviously I work at the institution, at the, at the college, and there have been concerns expressed about racial bias. And that's, I just wanna make sure we're actually going to go in to address, get the data needed to ask some real questions. Good. Yeah, well, Kahan and I have met personally, you're, I could hear all your words, but you're a little faint. I don't know if you can get closer to your microphone. I could hear you okay, but just barely. But um, I would have a follow-up question back to you when you say there are, you, you mentioned there are incidents of racial bias. Are you talking about particularly with our police department or police in general or between members of the public and your cohort? Yes, bigger concern is I'd like to just focus on the data and let the data do the speaking. And if there's ways of produce, producing demo, what I did for Kingston was I asked for a demographic breakdown by level of offense, misdemeanor, felony, so on and so forth, demographic and gender breakdown of that over a five year period. 
And it was, that was where at first glance the numbers didn't look, but when you went and you started slicing and comparing to percentage or representation in the population, that's when things got alarming. Um, yes, from students and individuals on the campus, I have heard those concerns, but if they're not coming forward and saying a report, then I'm not gonna bring that forward. Um, that's a separate problem that needs to be tackled. Uh, but I think a clear place where we can start is what does the data say? Because that's, you know, th that is information that's collected internally. Hey, Kahan. Yes. Hey, you know, maybe, you know, and I mean, we'll, we'll quick touch on this, but maybe you and I can be in contact as well. And maybe you can be uh, uh, kind of a, a spokesman for any of the students having any issues. You know, I know recently, uh, there, was a, there was a young lady who made a complaint um, that she was, uh, that somebody had said a racial slur to her in the village of Red Hook in the crosswalk. Um, I offered, I contacted, I reached out to Bart three different times to, you know, maybe, maybe get a neutral person. I, I wanted to take her complaint so I could investigate it so that if someone did that, I obviously could hold them accountable. Um, I asked for her contact, her email. I asked for someone to be a neutral person in the middle. They reached out to her. She, she just, she didn't want to make a complaint about it. So maybe if you are like a spokesman and obviously you have pretty close ties with Bard, you and I could work together to maybe make that a little bit easier conversation. Okay, thanks Pat. But on Kahan's underlying question, for instance, this month we show arrests for eight. Breakout, the breakout we see is six in the village of Red Hook, two in the town of Red Hook. We don't get a report. Was it a person of color? Or was it whatever? That's not the depth. And I think that's what Khan is, Khan is asking is, is there something, I imagine on a arrest record, there's something that details um, racial characteristic or, yeah. or you know, the, the racial status. But, um, you know, we know a few of us have talked separately. You know, the village of Reddick is essentially, I think, 95% white. Um, and the town is half a point below 90% white. Um, we don't have a lot of minority. And when, we go, when one goes through this booklet, you can see sections that are definitely more in tune with when you're talking about community policing, getting the right attitude and the right police in minority neighborhoods. And we don't have that same thing. But I think what Kahan's getting at is sensitivity. And I think the state, I think I've seen some proposed or actual legislation coming where there will be more demographic, if that's the right word, data on even VNT records. Um, so but if we could. Kingston somehow has that information. I don't know what their practice is. When I did a full request, I got it. And that is where the devil is in the details, is when you start slicing populations, you know. Um, again, the, the two that I had noticed was the over-arresting or disproportionate arresting of African-American males, the under-arresting of white females. You don't get that information unless you're collecting that um, information at the time of uh, of the of the contact or the encounter so if we're not doing that then what i would say is we're going into a process void of some information that helps us to make an honest assessment maybe things are just fine um but without that there's no definitive way of saying that then that's only one of several questions that could be asked every time there's an arrest made and then the arrest demographics in the screen it asks those questions Okay, good. So then there's that information exists. Correct. Can I ask um, about the CGC subcommittee? About whether or not Red Hook is planning on enrolling in that program? I just adjusted my volume up. I'm sorry, could you repeat your question, Mel Corker? Um, the CJC committee, subcommittee, it's on um, page 63. They talk about this, the idea that you would um, help review this sort of um, information. It's a it's a um, subcommittee that is being offered by the county, but the municipalities actually have to enroll in it. Yeah, let me just find that page myself. Um, Criminal Justice Council, right? CDC. Mm -hmm. They say they'll help examine traffic stop data, arrests, incarceration, excessive bail amounts by ethnicity. Yeah, let's see. I have some highlights here. I just want to refresh my brain. Uh, 
but this is somewhere earlier in the um, uh, maybe some other board members could remember where they read it too. But this, this page says the county will establish the Dutchess County Criminal Justice Council subcommittee. So there already is an existing criminal justice council, which, as I understand, is composite of the district attorney's office. And um, I don't know if anybody can find that section of the book where it talks about it. I think it was very early in the booklet. Um, Anybody have a grasp on that paging or an index of uh, grab it for them? Um, oh. Sorry, it's um, it's not actually about the um, the existing Dutchess County CJC. It's a community stakeholder recommendation that they would have a specific subcommittee dedicated to data analysis. Yeah, I get the subcommittee part, but I was just looking for. I thought somewhere in the book it described what the CJC CJC is. I remember it's. I remember it was the DA's office, but I can't remember who else was already in there. I don't know if it's the larger police agencies, but um, but the village of Reddick would certainly welcome any and all professional and respected guidance. Um, so it says. Review training policies, oversight systems, oversee community satisfaction surveys. We can put it on our list of uh, items to consider. It sounds like, uh, if I read it right, it doesn't exist today. Um, is what I'm saying. Um, thank you, you too. Let's see. So, originally, before Will Noonan became an appointed member to the village board. He was a stakeholder. Will came from a background of um, union and um, human services. Uh, he had a lot of skill and talent. So uh, for, since this is a big part of our project, we brought him up to the board. He and I spent many hours going through the book. And I don't know, Will, if you had anything you wanted to throw in while you're listening and so forth. Uh yeah, Ed, Ed, what I, I did was I went to pages 124, 25, and 26. And I tried to determine uh, what was doable now and what, was, what are the long-term goals and then what are the associated costs, if any. And what do we ha currently have in place? <clears throat> well, when I go back to page... 26, 27. Uh, well, 126, 127. Yeah, but then what's funny is um, you're saying 126, right? Yes. And I'm saying when I go back to page 26 and 27, I think there's sort of recapping or something there. But to answer your question, where I was headed is in the executive summary pages, I put a lot of red bullet points, I think. Yes. <laughs> The way I read the book, a lot of things repeat. They get restated, and if it came in a in public forum, it was here, and if it came up in a different basis, it, so it's, they're kind of repeating through the book. Um, but to answer your question, I, I would like to find the five or six that are most effective, most influential, and uh, also things we can afford. Um, I don't think any one of them, the body cameras, we found a way to afford. That was probably the biggest at least direct expense I can think of. Um, others are, um, we are in a shared services and we have long been with the County of Dutchess to send our officers to crisis intervention training, CIT. Um, our guys are really skilled and Patrick can tell some stories about de-escalating. Um, we, we tend not to get the racial incidents that need the de-escalation that we should have seen on the national level, but we still get situations where they have to defuse, de-escalate, calm down. 
Like another thing Patrick and I have been talking about is we get a lot of calls and that's one of the key bullet points that keeps reappearing. Um, the police acronym is EDP, Emotional Disturbed Persons. And they get on these calls where people are having a psychotic or a dif different incidents going on in their lives where their caregivers, family just cannot handle it. And um, the 911 dispatch calls and our officers have to roll. From what I can see, even more locally in Poughkeepsie, there was something fairly recently, maybe two months ago now, Patrick, where uh, police responded on a distraught EDP scenario and people got hurt and so forth. But um, what I'm getting at, Will, is I think in this executive summary, page seven, just some shorter recaps of the same thing that you're seeing on 126 and 127. But did you yes. pick a few that were catching your attention or fancy? Yes, I did. Let me just pick it up here. <clears throat> well, just looking at the first bullet on there. Um, Which page are you on? One, two, six. I'm sorry. Page, I'm on page seven. What, what were you on? Okay, I'll go seven. I'll go. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I was looking at page seven, and you know, okay. I, I, we're already um, on the road to, to the body worn cameras. Yeah. And Patrick's creating a policy on that. Mm -hmm. um, the second in um, the second bullet there, uh, we talk about non-enforcement contacts, and uh, you know local activities, and uh, maybe a street patrol. Um, and I think we're working on that already. Is that true, Patrick? Yeah, we we we've we've always done it. Yeah, we've yeah. always done foot patrols, parking patrols. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, Patrick, you finished up. Um, no, go ahead. Yeah. And I, I have some ideas how to make it. it it's yeah. always whenever we hire somebody, I'm smiling because not everybody sees this, but just so folks know, um, our police department is three core full-time folks. Patrick is the sergeant. He's the head, the lead, essentially practically works at chief of police, even though that's a different title and different civil service rules. And you know, there's a lot of underlying legal and uh, civil service parameters here. But um, so three full time. And then depending on the time of year and what our cycle is, we could have six or eight part time. Our department has a good name and a good reputation. So our part timers build hours here and then move off to city of Poughkeepsie or city of Middletown or different full-time jobs, state police. Uh, we've got, we're a good training point um, for folks. And uh, where it's headed is um, there's this, this base group. And when we interview them, we always stress community policing, community policing. And um, and I, I think I've come up with a way, I think I might want to, Patrick and I have not really talked about it, but mimicking something I was reading the city of Kingston has done where on a given shift, a certain expectation of time would be expected in the officer's duty in most days. You know, we can't, police work is like, the past three or four days has been hard to talk to Patrick because there's so much going on. Um, he's not sitting there, he's a sergeant, but he's also, since we're a small operation, he's also, he's, he's, like, he's out there doing things, um, not just managing the, the force. And um, that's the nature of our budgets and our size. And that brings up another question for long, long range planning. What we've been looking to, the town of Red Hook has 11,000 folks, the village has 2,000. Right now, we share a lot of the burden, the financial burden of the police department. And we've worked with town electeds to get them to do more contribution toward us. But my pers personal perspective, and I think the board would agree, is we don't have quite enough um, from them. And we augment some of our expenses with the school resource officer. We also, like I said earlier, we have a contract with the school, which generate, generates some money. So, but in the community sense, we view the village as sort of the cultural and economic hub. And most of the people that would interact with police. So if we could do more proximity, it would be in the center of the village area where we have something. And, Part of this project is I want to come out with something that 
makes that more specific and more routine. We have these wonderful people that know me, you know, I like to bicycle ride a lot. We have two great bikes and they're like, you know, kind of mountain bike, road bike hybrid with, you know, marked up for police and they're rigged out. And one of our, a few of our officers are certified for bike patrol. And we use them on hard scrabble day and certain big parades. And it's just awesome to see in seasons when you can ride a bike to see them out there. So it's one thing on the world bullet point and that's going to be something but it's not like we're not doing it now it's sometimes things happen and it moves and gets to put into a third or tertiary level of demand and then so some of we could bring it back up a notch or two can i can I ask a question sure um so you just said that we're almost like a training thing so like most of most of the officers are moving on after a certain amount of time right so uh, uh, not uh, all the time but no. yeah, not all, but what's your thought where you're headed? Um, okay, but how does that work with, you know, keeping the culture maintained and, and community? Like if, if you have a new officer that's here and you train him and he gets to know the community and then he moves on, mm -hmm. how does that work? But that part is a problem. Um, on the flip side, a positive side is, uh, my personal opinion, it's not necessarily a correct opinion, but I think we tend to get the younger folks coming to work here and we can mold and form and develop, um, what's the expression, um, policy, each procedure. It's like we can give them our culture, our outlook. And I think they also come to us, I think, with less inside implicit bias. I think they're, since they're younger, they're coming, they don't have a lot of the biases that older folks do. And um, if I can try so I think to it's a catch, you know, it's six, one, half to the other. But if I can try to just answer her question, because it's a good question, right? You know, it's not the first time I've been asked that question. Um, and, you know, not, not to pat myself on the back or any, or any of our other senior officers, but it comes down to management, right? Um, the majority of the officers that we have uh, that, we'll say they're 22, 23 to 27, and they eventually get on a full-time job, they excel really well at the jobs they go to. And, and there's a reason for that. You know, in our police department, obviously, you know, there's not many of you who know what we do on a daily basis or um, the call that we go on. But the difference in our police department is, is I don't handle everything and then just, you know, and kind of feed them along. I teach them. You know, you're on field training for three, four, five, sometimes six months. I say it all the time. An officer doesn't, you know, really get comfortable in the village of Red Hook till they're there a year or two years, till they're really comfortable with what they're doing. And they never do things by themselves. They're trained by seasoned guys. You know, I have, I'm fortunate to have a couple of detectives per diem, $20 an hour when I only need them. Um, but they're senior officers. They've been on other jobs 26 years, 28 years. One of my detectives, worked for the city beacon for 25 years. He worked for the federal bureau of narcotics for another six years. He's a college professor. Um, he comes with a lot of knowledge. You know, I've been on 14 and a half years. I know I, I grew up around here. So our officers have a good rapport with the community because they're taught that way. And whether they're here a year, two years, three years, or four years, the, even the newer, some of my newest officers are loved the most where the, the people request them. Um, you know, Father Power from the church, the schools, whatever it might be. So it's a group, it's a very good question because if I was in your shoes, I would ask the same thing. Um, and it comes, it's, it's what I, 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 I it's, a, it's like a demand of you have to do these things. You have to be involved in the community. It's a huge part of what we do. Community trust is without that, you have nothing. Um, so I demand that. And we have the officers that we have and they get, they're constantly getting training and they're constantly mirrored off other officers and during field training. And that's how they're taught. So when they go to other jobs, they excel really well because they have so much more knowledge than if you were to be placed in a big job, you start bottom of the totem pole. You're not involved in investigations. You're not involved in, uh, in talking to you know, some of the youth, you know, you're, you're answering calls, you're in a car and that's all you do. I don't want to interrupt, but okay. why don't they stick around? 
but you know, a full time. If we're, putting in, if we're putting in that training, why why don't we have? You know? I, I I wish I could put on more full time people, but we don't have the full time positions to give to them. Otherwise, they would stay. Okay. If Do you I feel like that would be an improvement in culture to have, you know, more time full time police officers? What, what do you mean in culture? Just in, in that people would know who they are. That you'd be able to, I, I guess you're you're saying that because you do the training, the culture is fine. I can I, in my in my 14 and a half years here at this police department, um, uh, I've never had uh, a racially biased incident um, uh, regarding our police department. Um, I've had some complaints recently, obviously with the bar Kyle stuff, and, I, and I'm trying, I'm willing to help. I'm first in line if someone can help me, but I'm, I'm not getting any complaints. No one's actually filing a complaint. I'm hearing about it from social media. Um, so I don't see an issue with that. We've never had an issue with that. Um, if there was an issue, I'd want to be the first to know so I could you know, address it. But I, in all my years here, I've never had that issue. So no, I don't see, just be, I don't see that um, uh, because they're here, whether they're here a year or five years, there's, there's no difference in that. I don't see a difference. Maybe some other board member would want to chime in, but we probably spend uh, a lot of time between management and Patrick mentioned um, in the hiring process, we have access to these pretty highly skilled, um, we call them detectives, but they're retired from bigger agencies, mm -hmm. types of folks, they have masters in public administration, as well as 25 years police experience. They teach at SUNY Ulster and the Academy and cr criminal justice programs. We have <coughs> Um, so we get screened to us what we consider the best candidates from the local academies. In a way, it's a source of pride. I think we get really good employees. We train them really well, but economics do drive a lot. It's a lot of them have to have another job somewhere. Some are working two police jobs. Um, and is that because the budget is not being carried as much by input of it would be in the end i think it would be a conversion process that's why in my heart of hearts and i've told the board and told the town supervisor i think in the end and hildebrand's heard this too we're talking years from now but it should be a town of red oak police department and the village contracts to them for a piece of the protection they have a 1.2 billion dollar tax base we have a 200 million dollar tax base it's really hard for us to fund a police department. Um, we do feel that whole health and safety welfare, you know, the guardian side of the world that these guys provide, um, we feel we need it. We don't want to defer off to the sheriff's department or state police for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, but that would be like a five-year plan maybe. And we've made that concept. We've, we see a shared, um, uh, Justice Center, where you have fire company, emergency services and justice, we have fire company, police, and um, maybe even the courts somehow in a building, which in my mind could be the current firehouse, um, where the, you have dispatch, you have radio, you have, because a certain amount of policing is a little grimy and blue collar, you know, bad things happen and they come back after a day out in the woods, you know, it's, they need almost, um, an area that's not the upstairs of Village Hall. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we see certain things go on that we don't need to know and see. Um, it's not the nicest job in the world to be a cop. But anyway, it, it is something we work with, Mel Corka. Um, and we, where it's headed is that we do spend a lot of time screening, interviewing, um, <laughs> like anywhere. It's a, almost like an act, I would call it an acquisition cost. You got to get the right candidate and you spend most time on them. Um, we don't have any formula where we work for years, you know, we could think about that as a board, I guess, but that doesn't seem possible in my mind as far as the world of an economic world. You know, people have to go where they can make a living and pursue their career goals. So can I go uh, back? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sure. interrupt. No. Can I go back to Khan's um, question about data? Did I hear that you are collecting that data? It's just not being um, formed in a report to the board, but it is being collected at the stops. And I feel like I interrupted that thread earlier. Patrick, you there? I heard him say yes to this question. 
He said yes, that information, I mean, I don't want to speak to Patrick, I obviously can do that. He said yes, that information is, correct, is collected, but my second question about data, I see the section in here where they have the town hall meeting or, or forum or whatever you call it. I, I, attended, I attended that session. Um, is there any other, has there been any other methodology of soliciting data from the community about policing other than go have a cup of coffee with whomever? Has there been any formal type assessment of that, whether it be college students, whether it be the local residents? Um, the devil's in, in what we don't know. For example, if Patrick's mentioning, we hear about things on social media related to racial concerns, yet no concerns comes forward. Therein lies the problem, and not, not just with Red Hook, let me be clear about that, is that there's a fear of coming forward. And how do we get to the genesis behind that? That fear is real. I was a victim of racial bias in Kingston. It took me about a day and a half before I said, yeah, I really have to go forward and do this. I'm 50 something years old with a PhD and 30 something years, I've supervised police departments before. And there was a reluctance for me to come forward. So it's getting down to the weeds of that information so that if there's an issue, we have um, the, the information needed to address it. I think there's low hanging fruit. Body cameras is low hanging fruit. I'm not saying that's not expensive fruit, but um, body cameras are low hanging fruit. It's the, what's the long range? How do we start to look under the rocks and in the underbelly of, of what is a very difficult job and start to get to what could potentially, are there some real issues here that we need to be asking questions? So I guess my ask is, is there, should there be some other form of collecting data if we don't have that already at regarding police community relations, regarding things like that? So real quick on that is, you know, when you say, you know, I know you're saying the data and the stuff you have from Kingston, but let's say there's not an official complaint made we're actually, or we're not actually, we're not going to have that data. You see what I'm saying? So that's why, like you said, I mean, you obviously are, have a PhD. You're a very smart man. You and I have been on boards before. I'm hoping you and I can work together where if, and maybe you can be that neutral person from a student at Bard where you and I can sit with that student. They can make a complaint, make an official complaint on what they have, because I know I can go through numbers. I can look at arrests, but <laughs> if there's some other complaints that you're, that you're hearing about a bar that I'm not hearing about a bar. That's where I'm hoping you and I can work together so you can bring it to me. You can be their safety blanket. You and I work together. We've been on other boards to be together. And then we can, then obviously I can open an investigation and take, a, take an actual a real complaint rather than just hearing it from third party that it was on, it was on a social media site somewhere, you know, because I'll do it. I've said it a couple of times, I will do the work. I have no problem doing it. I just need a complaint. That's all. And if you can help me with that, obviously the kids trust you. That would be awesome. Again, Kahan and Patrick, I think that's one of the prime reasons we're here in this project and here tonight. You know, we're not starting it tonight. We've been in it for three months or so, but that's one of the underlying goals. And we've seen through some other things, what I would touch on before, implicit bias. And I'm, I'm not pointing at the police on this. I think just in our, in Redwick, in our county, in our country, we are driven by implicit bias that many of us don't even know we have. And it's like, and that's what, it was okay. I was telling Patrick a story. Will gave me um, a book uh, written by Timothy Egan, who's a New York Times columnist and reporter. I think he's a Pulitzer Prize winner too, but it's um, to do with a, an Irish patriot, we'll call him, with Thomas Marr. Um, and it's talking about 1840s, 1850s, and 60s of the U.S. And he's over here as a essentially a political refugee from Ireland and um, becomes a general in the Union Army. And at the time, New York State had made slavery, had, uh, slavery was no longer legal in New York and Massachusetts, the Civil War was starting to brew. But you might all recall, and I always wonder where these biases come from. Back in 1850, they're talking about the bounty hunters would come up from the South to, to capture, recapture escaped and freed slaves. And I was kind of shocked. And again, I don't mean it as Pershing as any modern day police, but in the culture, um, it mentioned that in the big cities, the police would sometimes point out where the candidates were to be recaptured and taken south. So that was like, wow, you know, it's like, 
is something going back to 1850 that's in the culture and before you know, I think it, it predates that even like slavery has been here for a long long time I just think we have and I think that that's what the governor's trying to get at how do we identify and iron out or at least weaken some of these biases that we might not even know we had um, you know, it, it, it's, we're white yeah, everybody here in the village board is white and um, you know a lot of our stakeholders um, are white we have you know, we, we, that's why we tried to get a broad brush as we could. But um, anyway, what were you going to say something? Yeah, it, um, in going through the book and trying to identify what is implicit bias, mm. and uh, the, another one of the terms is what what is internal and external procedural justice. Um, and I struggled to find definitions of that. I mean, you, you kind of hit it on the head there. Um, you know, it's things that have been going on for so long that are, might be ingrained in us that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And how do we, how do we get to that core? I mean, I, I maybe getting too philosophical or what have you here, but how do we get to that core of, you know, what are my, um, uh, implicit biases? I grew up in a city or multicultural neighborhood, all that, but I don't know. <laughs> um, and in, in terms of the, uh, the procedural justice, in reading as much as I could about it, it boils down very simply to respect for the person you're dealing with, whether it's a traffic stop or, um, you know, anything more serious. And, and, and that respect goes both ways. And when with the, um, with the procedural justice, uh, from what I've read and, and some of it's in the book, that if the law enforcement person uh, treats the, say, traffic stop person with, um, with respect, that helps an awful lot to build the trust um, in, in, in law enforcement. I'm, lo I'm losing my thought here, but. No, it's true. And the, Patrick, would, you might, yeah, I think our guys operate on that premise. And um, but I think you're right. Well, we had a conversation, you know, what is implicit bias? I think I have a working knowledge, but how do you drive it out of somebody? I think it's more just illustrating it and moving, moving it to the forefront somehow. No, that's the thing, is that, is, well, the answer maybe hop on some of you're saying about procedural justice and implicit bias, you know, you know, when, when all these things came out with New York state, obviously, you know, all my officers were coming to me asking for body cameras. They wanted the body cameras. You know, obviously I went to Ed uh, for the body cameras as well on the board. And, and then obviously we're getting them in a few months. I said, you know, and, but I was talking a step further. I didn't only get my officers trained in procedural justice, and implicit bias. I have two instructors now in my police department in procedural justice and implicit bias. So, I took it a step further. I never just, I'll go to the training, get a certificate and come back. Because after a period of time, you have to have refreshers on those things. New officers come in. I want them to have it immediately. So I took it a step further and I have two of my officers that are instructors for New York State, for the Department of Criminal Justice Services. They're instructors now in procedural justice and implicit bias. So, you know, obviously for a small PD, I, I make sure I push it to, so we have the training and everybody has to take it seriously, you know, and obviously we are. So these are some things that I think the community or the stakeholders probably don't know um, about the educators and the trainers that we have. That's okay. great. Put that out there. Can I, am I interrupting anybody? No, good. I was going to go back to what Kahan was saying about the idea of having, you know, being open to hearing different complaints. Um, that I think that maybe the model that they would be able to feel comfortable coming to you, Patrick, or Hildebrand, sorry. Um, that that's a difficult model, that maybe we should have multiple avenues for people to make complaints, that there should be some sort of, you know, board or committee that people could come to that, you know, that's from the village, the municipal level, that people would feel more comfortable or that it would be safer you know, one of the things they talked about in the report was having multiple avenues so that, you know, you would, you need to be open to hearing stuff. 
if we are not hearing things and you are hearing rumors, maybe the complaint system is not set up in a way that people feel comfortable with. Yeah, I have, uh, you know, and um, sometimes I get complaints and, you know, right now we're, we're taking a complaint. So if you hypothetically want to make, make a complaint, we're not letting anybody in the building, obviously, with COVID and all the restrictions. I have a very clear Redwood Police Department complaint, complaint form. I can give it to you. You could fill it out, go through all of it, fill it out, give it back. I review it. I can contact you over the phone, whatever it might be. You know, so it's not like you have to sit there, sit in my office, sit in the police department. You can. I can meet you somewhere. You're more than welcome. But some people don't want to. Some people just want the form and they want to fill it out. And then they want to have a conversation over the phone, which is fine as well. Um, but with the complaint form, at least it allows me to look into something. It gives me some kind of ground to say, okay, what was the complaint? What was the day? What was the officer? What was the, what was the meat of the complaint? What was the traffic stop? What was the arrest? If I'm not getting any of that, it's very difficult to investigate something I have nothing on. I'm getting it second or third hand, never, and it has to be from the actual complaint. Like you couldn't fill out a complaint form for a friend of yours because you're, you're not the complainant that person is. So that's why I, I try to make it as easy as possible. People are uncomfortable. You can, you can pick, you know, someone else can pick it up. Obviously I have to, you know, speak to you on the phone. Obviously there's some proof that you are the complainant, but I can't follow up with anything, literally nothing, if I don't have a complainant. You know, it's, it's, it makes it impossible. Let me Excuse me. Uh give you the other side of that very scenario that you just mentioned. So in September, I had an incident with a Kingston police officer. I was kind of shaken while this happened. I was literally jogging yeah. and an officer stopped me and said, we got complaints that you were going around looking through cars. Excuse me, what? I had stopped to type an email. So I'm sitting here going, what do I do? At this point, I'm now afraid to move very yeah. quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots of people who look like me that moved got shot and killed in the street. So I'm very concerned now. I don't want to move. Okay. This person sits there is egging me on a little bit, like, you know, not overly, but clearly this person was out. He, he had a job to do, and I acknowledge yeah. it. The call came in for somebody that was wearing uh, a tank top. I was wearing a hoodie. So yep. I had the exact opposite of what this person was wearing. So now I walk home, I'm shaking because I'm like, oh my God, had I moved too quickly, something could have happened because yep. I know this officer, this officer doesn't know me. So in my mind during this entire conversation, the only thing I'm focusing on is how do I not get shot? Right. So I get home. Now I'm like, what do I do? All right. I could, I called and that's when I found out the person that they were looking for was wearing a completely different outfit than what I had on. Yeah. Now I'm sitting here. So if I fill out this form, now they have my address and they know where I live. So I have to now trust that. Well, so will the officer that I had this issue with, will he see this too? Well, he's a cop. I'm not. His word means more. How do I know I don't get something planted on me? How do I know he doesn't now circle my house more? These are all real concerns that people have. When you don't have a badge and a gun, you are the underdog, and there are real consequences of that. So I understand completely. Filling out a form is what you need to initiate a process. What I would say to you is that there are people on the other side of that that are not in positions of power, that have been historically marginalized, that have very real reasons to be afraid to fill out that form. Right, but we are not the Kingston Police Department, so we, I can't have a conversation about that officer's training or how they do it or how they do the complaint forms. I'm not talking about the Kingston Police Department. I can talk about the Reddit Police Department that I have run for many, many, many years. I've been here for 14 and a half years. I can tell you exactly what we do and how we do it. If you want to fill out a complaint form or you have a student that wants to fill out a complaint form, don't put your address. I don't care. Put a phone number. Put somebody I can interview and talk to. I don't need your address. I don't need it. Address means nothing to me. I'm not coming to your house. I'm not coming to your house unless you need me for an emergency. I don't need to come there. So, but you're talking about the Kingston PD. Tell me what your experience is with the Red Hook Police. In the and I think that's part of where you're missing it. It a person who comes from a marginalized community doesn't know a blue uniform from a gray uniform from a whatever uniform. And okay. in 
same way that people have implicit bias against yeah. persons of color and how they might act and why they might have their hand on the gun when somebody acts, the, people also have the same impressions about cops and they okay. don't see all of this. They see a person of authority that yep. can do bad things to them of which they will not be believed. So I've asked you twice so far in the Zoom call. I will work with you. If you have somebody at Bar College which where you're a professor, I will work with you. You can be the middle person. I feel like I can trust you. I've been on multiple committees with you. I will work with you. If there's a complaint, you come to me directly. I'll send you my email, my information, and private message right here. We can work together if there's any issues and hopefully resolve that for our community, which is what we're working on as stakeholders. I'm hoping you and I can work together and, and then we can resolve some of these things that or concerns that people might have that I, don't, that I haven't seen or I don't see happen in our police department. I'm open. I'm willing to work with you. We can do it so that there isn't an issue. You know, we don't have to, you know, city of Kingston, unfortunately, I can't speak for them, right? But I get what you're saying. As a whole, I get what you're saying. I don't see it in all my years here running this police department. I've never had that issue. If you are hearing things potentially at the campus, let's work together. Let me know about something I'm not hearing. And I think we're all going to need to work together. But the first part of that is going to be understanding that this is a national issue for which the Red Hook Police Department is not exempt. The fact that you've heard things on social are. media and you haven't gotten a complaint, that's an indication that as a community, we've got to work together to pull back the pieces of the onion to find out what exactly is going on. This is bigger than Red Hook, and Red Hook's not exempt from it, is what my point is. Correct. So you're saying because we don't have complaints, we should peel back the onion to f so we get complaints? I feel like what? people come forward. We should peel back the onion to see if there really is an absence of complaints yeah. or if there really is. is. And let me say, even yeah. if there aren't formal complaints, community. Yeah. Policing is always a good thing. There's nothing yeah. bad about doing that. Yeah. But I'm suggesting that you there are probably things there that we could get to the bottom of. And to me, the bigger issue is not that there aren't complaints. It's why haven't people felt comfortable enough to do that? That's well, the big issue for me. That okay. we're, 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 we're assuming there's complaints. We're assuming it. I mean, you're hypothetically saying, hypothetically, there could be a complaint. No, I'm saying I've been in meetings. Okay. They're not saying good things about the Red Hook Police Department. Okay, then bring them to me. Let me address them. Oh, I heard the police department. Why would you not? Jump in. Patrick, gone. This is good discussion. It's part of what this whole thing's about. Um, I had the same discussion with people in backyard COVID areas. Excuse me. I have many hours trying to talk. Uh, oh. I raised my hand, but I think nobody's um, Who are you, looking Brian? at me. My name is Cecilia Cortina. Hello, Cecilia. I just, uh, I... Uh, I'm a case manager and work with human trafficking and domestic violence um, survivors. And the majority of my clients are undocumented uh, and, and are uh, Latinx uh, from Mexico and Guatemala. And uh, I just want to say that it's a, it's a reality that these people are afraid to come forward when something happened to them. In fact, we help them to be, um, to advocate for them with police officers that we trust. Um, and that way they can seek uh, justice. So one of the, the ways that, for example, traffickers blackmail them is saying that, you know, you don't have papers. Um, so you are going to work uh, for me in horrible conditions and maybe paying me, paying me a debt that never ends. Um, so traffickers use this, um, criminalize these people or let them know that nobody's going to hear them. And it's a reality that they are afraid of, of the police. And uh, as uh, Kahan said uh, they don't see the difference between immigration and, and, and the police. So on top of that, the natural environment is not helping them to see that if, they, if something happens to them, they can come forward, they can go to the police. I'm not saying that all police is bad. I'm just saying that things happen and these 
past uh, years uh, have been really, really tough in this community. And we have to, to admit that this is happening. Uh, I understand that there are no complaints, but that doesn't mean that uh, things are happening to good people. And I, I just uh, ask uh, for the police department in Red, Red Hook to recognize this and be open um, to maybe no maybe people doesn't want to uh, come with their um, with their situations and putting in a complaint because it's not confidential and that's a scary uh, when you don't have uh, papers you can imagine how scary you you could be here um, so I just want to to mention this thank you thank you one question I have for clarification when you mentioned complaint Let's say with the undocumented person you're talking about that's come in with essentially human traffic, essentially could be considered slave labor, so to speak. When you say complain, you're talking about them complaining to authority to get protection is where my heart goes. Or are you talking about complaining about something the police person did to them? It seems like those people need whatever you do. Yeah, I'm just putting an example. Even when some, something horrible is happening to them, they are afraid to come forward. Yeah. And this is just an example how uh, people are afraid of the police. And maybe this is not something that just the uh, Red Hook police um, produce. No? This is something that is happening in the nation. And people are seeing these news and seeing the president talking about them and talking and saying that they are uh, like um, the criminals, right? Mm. So I, I just want to, to, to say and make people aware that this is happening and it's a reality and we can't deny that, True. that people are afraid. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking over my numbers here. When we're talking about demographics before in the village, um, it's actually our Hispanic percentage population is higher than our black population in the village. And in the town, um, same applies. It's 6% Hispanic, Hispanic Latinx in the town, whereas 3% black African-American in the, in the town. So, um, and we do see, and you know, myself personally, we see Latinx Hispanic folks here in the village and we try to make contact and try to work with them. But, they are, they do tend to just stay a little bit below contact for some reason, you know, so I'm not sure what all their documentation situations are, but, but we, it's good for Patrick and all of us to hear that, but thank you, Cecilia. Well, what I was going to say too, thank you. we've had the same, I've had this conversation with Kahan and with um, some people in backyard discussions from the RHEDI, um, the complaint process, you know, how does it get, sanitized down enough where the person complaining feels comfortable to the person receiving the complaint, but maintaining the fact pattern and the ability to act on it. Um, maybe the stakeholders could come up with a concept. You know, I, I maybe being naive, I said, well, the people can come to me, you know, and I'll talk to them. But then they're like, well, Ed, you're like, it's bad. You know, like somehow the same parameters or same, whatever aspersions that they might feel against the police, they, they feel against me. And it's kind of insulting. And it's insulting to the police too, I think. But um, I say, hey, you know, how do you neutralize the complaint where it still becomes effective? And I don't know that, I don't know the answer right now. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. I hope that you both don't think it's insulting that people have experiences, the personal experiences that, you know, inform how they feel towards the police in general. I think that if you were personalizing it, then we are going to really hit a wall. Yeah. Like no. people are, I'm just saying, if he says that oh, yeah, he feels personally insulting, yeah. I, th I think that's an unfortunate way of framing it in your head that people have, you know, experiences and there's histories and there's a lot of baggage, you know, culturally in this country, this nation, and we have to be aware of that. And if people are not feeling comfortable coming to us, mm -hmm. how do we fix that, you know? I think I think that's an implicit bias the other way then would be my reaction. You know, it's, we're, we're here to help and that's, but yeah, you know, it, it's a tough dilemma. I don't know who. I don't, I, I never take, I never take those things personal. Um, you know, it, it happens, right? I mean, you have to reach that. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. I don't think, you know, 
I, I've done this for a long time and um, I've helped a lot of people in my years of being here. You know, um, I don't put, you know, whether we help somebody who, you know, who's suicidal or we help somebody who's in a really bad domestic violence uh, situation. I work very closely with Rochelle McDonough. She is the lead person for the New York State Police and domestic violence. Her and I work very close together. I, I, I you know, um, everything's confidential. I send a lot of females to her that are in really bad situations. You know, domestic violence can be male or female, but you know, historically it's majority ma of females. And we have, we've, have, we've had some serious domestic violence incidents in our village. And you know, I take a lot of pride in being able to help somebody. And if they're not comfortable with coming to the police, I hope at some point I can create a relationship with somebody they know um, to create that channel so that we don't have to have somebody who's spooked. And, and if they are, you have to respect it. Like, I would never tell somebody they're wrong or not to do something. I mean, I have, you know, I have my feelings. I've had my feelings before I was a cop. I was pulled over. I was asked a million and one questions. Did I like it? No. Did it piss me off? A hundred percent. So I would have no right telling somebody else how to feel and I wouldn't. So, you know, and, and, and but you're right. You know, I mean, I, I never take it personal. Um, uh, it's, it's part of the job. Um, sometimes you hear things you don't like, but you know, um, at the end of the day, I know, I know we do the right thing. I know I do everything possible I can to help somebody. If you know somebody that doesn't want to come forward and hopefully you can be a, a neutral person to that party, I am more than willing. And I hope we can, you know, work together if there's an issue that I don't know about. Which is my, which is my thought. I previously asked the question about coming up with some way of soliciting data from the community. So it's not what if and who does who does have an issue and doesn't bring it up, but how do we collect data from the community so that we can actually have I would I like responding to data that we can actually give whether it's a survey, whether it's a something, so that we can say, look, here's what the people here's what our constituents have said. Now we have something to react to, even if they're afraid to come forward, maybe they're more apt to do something as part of a larger data collection process. So that was what my previous question was before. Thank you. On to another objective item we, we talked about um, in the book, they talk about use of deadly force. There are pages that um, comment where the larger agencies reviewed the smaller agencies use of deadly force and like we suggested prior um we follow a particular standard it's in our officers policy book because to be honest one of my nightmares always is i think any mayor with a police agency is our guys going to be safe or staff going to be safe and our public safe you know bad things can happen really quickly and what we saw with the national scene um we really want to protect against that and ours you know we have I have a copy of it here in front of me the first three words first uh four words rather are human life is sacred and you'll notice in the book it refers in the booklet that we that we have and the stakeholders have it um comments on that sort of statement it should be present somewhere and then we go through all the aspects of encounters and so forth and Patrick told me something one day because when something happens across the country or even locally something in Poughkeepsie or something in Wisconsin um, we'll talk about it a little bit and he indicated to me that he'll do some role playing with our people like not in the physical building scenarios but they'll they'll say if this was happening to you what's up and I was proud to hear that and it in a sense to me it reinforces you're thinking of their policy, you're thinking what should have been done, um, if something was wrong in the scenario, what was wrong, um, and it goes, you know, I was kind of, it helped me to think of that, but that, to know that, that they're thinking at that level of role play within seven or ten days internally within their organization, and uh, I think, I don't know, Patrick, if you want to talk about that anymore or whatever? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, training never stops, right? So training's important, education's important. Um, you know, anytime there's a potential national incident, obviously they're in most populated areas. Um, a bad, a bad, you know, an emergency or something bad can happen anywhere, big or small, regardless of the community. So a lot of times, you know, part of like in-service training, we call it. Um, you know, we do, you know, we do a lot of in-service training once a month. 
sometimes, you know, with COVID, it's been hard right now because we can't get together. Um, but, you know, when the officers come in, and, I, and I'll ask them different times. I see them all. I say, hey, you know, did you see what happened in the news the other day? Yeah. Well, if that happened here at the bank or at the post office, what would you do? How would you react to it? You know, I never, I never Monday morning quarterback somebody. I never say what an officer should have done or shouldn't have done. I wasn't there. I wasn't in their shoes. But I always use it as a training tool, um, like the body cameras as well. When we get those, that will be a training tool. You know, they go on calls. They have an incident. Um, you know, body cameras, part of our policies, we can use the videos of the training tool. You know, training never stops. So if I see a big incident or there's something national I see, I use it. You know, I take it and say, hey, there was a lot of uproar about this. This is what happened. This is how they reacted. What would you have done? How would you react in a situation based on your training? So, you know, that's something that, that, I, that I've always done. That's how I supervise. Um, constantly putting thoughts. You know, if you, just are, if you just come in, punch in for work every day, go out and do your normal routine, you get, you know, it, it just becomes repetitive. So I like, keep their minds thinking, um, you know, and, that, and that's why, you know, we have the people we have because they're constantly thinking and um, we're constantly, you know, doing different kinds of training. And even if it's not an official training, it's like a one-on-one -on -one thing. Um, you know, those are the things that we kind of do, that I do with them. Good. Yeah, and just you know, one of the more notorious cases was the Staten Island case a couple of years ago. But ours clearly says officers will not use a chokehold as a method of controlling or restraining a person. Um, so it's, we have that in our policy. I know um, when we talk about more cohesive uh, or more consolidated work with the town of Red Hook, I smirk a little bit in the sense that most of our more dangerous incidents have been town calls, we call it. In other words, um, when was that one, Patrick? 18 months ago, we were all here. November 15th last year. It was, um, what was we it? We shooting. It was, um, two of our officers responded to what sounded like a pretty routine Monday daylight thing. And uh, they get there and all of a sudden they're, they're being shot at. And Patrick and I were here talking and working and working protocol when weapons were discharged because our officers fired back. And um, we counseled each other. There was a lot of human emotion going on. You know, a couple of our people almost didn't come back from that call. Um, and I'll tell you right now, there were tears and different things going on in that, that department. And, uh, but also professionalism, they reacted and did the things they have to do with weapons discharge and so forth. And even to this day, um, brings pretty strong emotions. Uh, but where I was headed is, that's the one thing as the board and the mayor, you know, they, they do carry lethal force. And that's one of the tasks we're facing here. We have to make sure it's used properly if and when it ever is, and um, training and policy and, um, and policy and policy and policy. You know, it's, uh, we do have them equipped with tasers, which we did, what's that, maybe Brent remembers four or five years ago, Patrick, and yeah, we, that de-emphasizes, that takes a lot of uh, that <clears throat> one threat away, but they can't predict what they're rolling into. One thing I want to repeat and clarify, when a few of us talk about, whether it's Kahan or anybody, even us talking about complaints, um, I think we want to be clear, like, there's definitely a complaint process to the PD, but a lot of what we're talking about with the BARD representative Kahan is um, we hear through some social media of generic societal complaints about an incident of racial epithet or bias between individuals, not police to individuals. It's somebody yelling at somebody in the crosswalk who's not a police person, um, some resident. And one of our frustrations, and we've had direct conversations with other than Kahana Bard, like to put it up on social media, cast certain aspersions that we can't react to. And if we could get some facts in some shape or form, we have patrol, we have cameras, we have, you know, maybe we could identify what I would call <coughs> frequent flyers. Maybe there's some people or some group that's a problem here. But if we're not provided with some detail, but what I want to assert is we're not talking about complaints against our staff or our operation. It's, it's just general live complaints that kick around out there. Can I, I ask a question? What are, yep. Did somebody can say I, something? Yeah, I was going to, can I ask a question? Is that? <coughs> sure. 
can we redirect from, you know, I, I understand that you guys think that you're doing everything very well, but the point of this thing is to talk about what we think we could do better, you know, right? What, what we could improve. And from Ed and Patrick, I'm getting a lot of that. Everything is fine. We don't need to do anything better. Is there anything? And, you know, stakeholders are saying there are things that we think could be done better. There are ways, avenues to do this stuff. Well, no, I, I think you're misconstruing what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying okay. anything. Um, okay. but I'm going to stop talking in a minute, but <clears throat> from the September 26th forum, I took the concepts to the board, which I mentioned before, ideas posed by public. We take that all very seriously. We're, we're, I'm not pushing back and saying we're fine. I'm saying we can be better, and we are tasked with it. It's our, our duty to do better. Uh, I'm not saying... We're fine. What we're working to find is five or six bullet points that we're going to take on and do. You know, it's, um, and I, what I see, I think there's a short term between now and April 1, 2021, which is not that long. And then theoretically, some bigger concept things. What do we do? Um, and work. That's, that's why I see it. I'm not saying we're the best in the world. We, we can get better. Uh, but where we left off was. The body camera, I don't think Kahan meant it that way, but I don't consider it low-hanging fruit. I think it's a hugely protective and digital technology, easy to use, protects everybody's rights immediately. And um, it, we're going to move That's what makes it low-hanging fruit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, to me, that some kind of implies maybe not so good, but... Uh, no, uh, that's a win-win for everybody. That's good, why I'm saying low-hanging fruit. I'm glad you said that. Good. And then, um, yeah, we, right in this room I'm sitting at, we, we saw a demonstration of how it works. It's so simple for the officers to put on and wear and take off and they're durable. And Patrick mentioned that at a recent board meeting, like in a low light condition, they actually reflect what the officer sees, not what the cameras are lighting up with flash or infrared or anything. It's, um, it's, it's really state of the art um, equipment. So we'll move with that. And to the town's credit, they agreed to help us on that, separate and above our contractual agreement. Um, I think we want to do something with increase more contacts with what we'll call the, the non-law enforcement contacts. We do a lot now, Patrick, with school and school events. And SRO is essentially a piece of that. But I think we need a little more on the street contacts. And, uh, and then uh, procedural justice, implicit bias, as much as we're all saying, well, what does that really totally include? We're, we want to promote and push that further. Um, increase diversity of our law enforcement workforce. Um, we talked about how we recruit and different things. We have, I think the closest we come now, we've had various female and minority people, but um, they've all been really good and they've moved on. Right now we have one part-time female who is uh, multilingual and which is a help for certain things that Cecilia was mentioning and for, uh, you know, she can go out and, and she's a hardworking, excellent police officer, from what I can see. You know, would you agree, Patrick? Yeah, uh, Natalia's. Um, you know, yeah. everybody loves Natalia. Yeah. Um, you know, some of us have had some discussions. The county did move to taking folks that do not have the sixty credit hours of a police academy under the belt. I feel that's a little difficult for us because we don't have the depth of staff to take somebody totally, totally green and create a viable, safe, functioning police officer, but that's something we'll have to look at. Yeah. Um, identify training deficiencies. This is a realm that falls to management more than the board, but that's, um, I've tagged that as something we would uh, work with. Um, not in any real, real recent past that we ever disciplined somebody out of our department. Yeah, it's, um, and then um, um, Patrick and I had some long discussions today create alternative or co-responder programs to address social and medical issues. This, this goes to something here. Our guys, they carry AEDs, they carry, a lot of them are EMTs. Um, they, they're the guardian concept there, um, but they're not psychiatrists or psychologists. And Kahan and I had a conversation once. A lot of the problem is police are being asked to be counselors or therapists or um, intense dispute resolution experts but they're not and 
we work with the county and there's some differences of opinion. You know, the county is moving to more mobile crisis intervention units and do they exist now or not? Uh, it's a question. That ends, that ends at 11 p.m. every day. Yeah, and that's probably when the worst starts to happen, right? It's, um, well, you know, you know, mental health doesn't ever stop. It's, it's, a, it's a huge part of what law enforcement does. Mental health doesn't stop. It's very important. Um, I spoke to, we had, we had a call this week. Um, we got to the home, you know, I don't have to give details, but it was a mental health call for a gentleman. Um, and uh, the homeowner, the, the, the female there had said she had called mobile crisis first. They said they weren't available and uh, to call the police. So um, I would love to see uh, other people come out with us. You know, um, I think it's great. You know, we do, we, we do really well. None of us have a psychology degree. Obviously, you know, it, you know, it's obviously like a police thing, you know, we're, we're a psychologist, we're a mother, you know, we're a father, you know, we're a police officer, you know, we, we comfort in all situations and, you know, because we have no other option, you know, if someone has a mental health emergency, someone has to go, you know, I feel we do a really good job with it. But uh, bottom line is I spoke to um, the county today and I asked them, I said, hey guys, you know, we couldn't mandate someone to go. Um, there was no direct threat of uh, personal harm. So we couldn't make them go, but mo mobile health could have made them go. But uh, there's one person on from five to 11. And then after 11, there's nobody on. So, you know, and mental health doesn't stop. So I think part of the other issue is on a county level, potentially the funding of that, you know, one person to cover all Dutchess County from five to 11 and then zero from 11 to 8 a.m. I can assure you these guys are, I mean, police officers are running mental health 24 seven and we're stuck dealing with the task. We'll do it. I have no problem going to a situation, making sure it's safe before a counselor comes in. I'm all for it. It's just, they don't have the staffing to do it. One person for the county, it's impossible. You would wait hours potentially for somebody to come up. And that's really difficult to tell somebody who's having a mental health emergency you have to potentially wait an hour, two hours, you know, that's unfair. This document is coming from, or it's a review of the county. I don't know the genesis of it. I know it's tied to the governor's executive order, but it would seem like, I think that's completely unfair to put an officer in a mental health situation. I think that's unfair to the officer to do that to them. This is a county, this document, a county document, prompted by an executive order, what is the vehicle to influence the county to say that as you're making budgetary decisions, this needs to be factored in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lady I spoke to today, and I told her, I said, I have a meeting tonight. This is something that's always on my radar. Um, you know, we handle mental health situations really well because we've done it for so many years. So we're really good about calming people down and some people really relate to us really well. Um, but again, this is something that I've read in that, in that booklet that is, 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 a, is a bullet point of what they want to happen. But I'll be very frank with you. I mean, when the mayor read it to me, uh, you know, I chuckled because it's, it, it will never happen because I'm the one, I'm, I mean, we're out there going to mental health calls. We're on them. We just had one this week. I was at home. My officer called me, says, here's what I have. Here's the emergency. And the gentleman has, he needs some assistance but we couldn't make him go to the hospital. We couldn't mandate him because of there's no direct threat to harm himself. Um, the, the, the mother called mobile crisis first. They directed her to call 911, which prompts the police and we go there, no problem. And we handled it well. Um, but I said, what are the hours? If I need mobile crisis, I know the number to call. What's your staffing? What's my accessibility to somebody if I need them? Is that between eight and four, there's a certain amount of staff. I didn't get that number. Between 5 p.m. and 11 p.m., there's one person. From 11 p.m. to 8 p.m., there's zero. You can call the hotline, the hotline number. They will take the complaint, and at 8 a.m., they forward it to the mobile crisis team. For all Dutchess County, you know, that's – so that's, that's a difficult degree. And so I, I read it. I see it. I'm for it. But I know the reality to it because we're the one handling mental health calls. And I know the reality is, you know, I, I, I kind of joke with the mayor. I didn't joke. I said it with the mayor today or the other day. I said, it's easy to stay on the soapbox and say, here's what we're going to do. Here's our plan. Here's how we're going to do it. 
It's easy to write it in a book of a pen and paper. But bottom line is when the calls go out, we are going, we are securing a situation, making everything safe, and there's no weapons, no one's violent. We're it. We are the first, we are it. We're the first line of defense to it. There's, unless it's during the day and there's certain staff on. Now, I don't want, you know, 99% of the time, we are handling mental health calls and not just the running police, all police departments. Mm-hmm. Can I uh, add something? Just sure. Amy, so, Amy. another piece of information. Uh, the county recently, this is in support of um, what Pat is saying. The county recently announced a plan to privatize the mobile crisis intervention uh, team, MCIT. Um, and so we're about to lose, we meaning Dutchess County taxpayers, about to lose our ability to um, influence more, um, the staffing, the hours, the budget being put into that. And I suggest that anyone who is genuinely concerned about this and looks at this report and how much the county is saying that team is a part of their plan, um, attend some of the county meetings um, that are to uh, these things and make that known because once it's privatized, there's even less ability to um, to affect how it's staffed. And Patrick is right, absolutely. I would 100% agree. Mental health does not wait. It, it doesn't. And I, and I can tell you, you know, and I, like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't go to these meetings and say, hey, here's what we do, here's how we do it. I can tell you, I have multiple letters in my desk that I would never show you the people's names, but I can let you, I would let you read it. That we've helped, we had, we had a gentleman couple, uh, last year that was going to jump off the bridge. The father couldn't find his son. We tracked him down. We stopped him. And he's doing awesome today. Awesome. Nope. He has a great career. He's doing good. He graduated college. And he's doing really well. And he was that close from jumping off the bridge, right? These are real things. I don't care who it is, you, me. We all have somebody that we know or a family member who has some kind of mental health issues or who has in the past. We all do it. And, and it's, a hu- it's a huge part of what we do. Mental health is a big deal, especially right now with being trapped at home because of COVID restrictions, not being employed, losing their jobs, not getting, you know, losing their houses, being kicked out of their apartments. These are huge things. And, it all, and, and a lot of people live with mental health that goes undiagnosed or certain little things trigger them. And I, I can assure you, I, I read it in the book and I see it and I take it seriously and I love it and I'm on board. The resources, like she said, the resources are not there. And the people that do it are very good. I talk to them. I trust them. They're great at what they do. They're well-educated. There's just not enough of them. You can't ask one person to cover all of Dutchess County. You know how many mental health calls go out between 5 and 11? Mm-hmm. It's impossible. So we deal with it. We take them to, you know, Mid-Hudson Regional, or we take them to Kingston. Obviously, Northern Dutchess doesn't have a facility for that. So we take them there. They're on potentially a 24-hour hold. Out they come, they get a ride home, or sometimes they call me looking for a ride. Obviously, we can't run out a taxi, but I get them a ride. There's many people I paid for the taxi out of my own pocket for. I just did it for a guy three days ago. I paid for his taxi. He needed a ride home. I mean, these things happen, 24-hour hold, boom, you're right back out, and, but you still have the same problem 24 hours later. So I agree. Um, that's my position. Patrick, we're talk, talking about mental health. Mm-hmm. You talk about um, talking about a potential jumper off the bridge. You're talking about two officers being shot on, shot at. Shot at. What, um, what assistance do we have for our officers in those traumatic situations? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, good question, Will, and I, I appreciate it. You know, um, those that you take very seriously. Obviously, we have a union. Um, uh, uh, the union officers a lot of uh, offers a lot of resources. Uh, I work very closely with the state police, and I work very closely with the sheriff's office. Um, during our shooting, um, Officer Starrett and um, uh, Officer, uh, Officer Tellis both got shot at from 15 yards away, multiple rounds. It was a pretty traumatic situation for them. Um, and uh, uh, the state police and the sheriff's office both offered, uh, they have officers that are trained um, in, those, in those situations. They're, they're trained for that. So those officers came in. Obviously, the village. Uh, uh, offer the services as well. So we have a lot of uh, resources for those things. Um, you know, obviously, I can't talk much about that case because it's still, it's coming to trial. Um, uh, still pending. It's still coming to trial here pretty soon. So, um, but yeah, so there's, it's like, it's, there's, it's there's like multiple book. resources that we have 
that what that were put in place um, that were taken advantage of. Um, it wasn't an option. I, I, I made made them take advantage of it. It wasn't something I gave them an option on because those are serious things, you know. Um, but like you said before, well, you know, real situations uh, can happen very quickly. Um, and I get where, you know, Kahan was saying before when he was in Kingston running, he didn't know what to do. He kind of froze because they were looking at him and looking through cars. I, I get his stress. I, I mean, to a certain degree, I wasn't in his shoes, but I get you have to respect where he's coming from and what he's saying because we're not in that situation. So when these officers go through that, it's a real traumatic thing. But 10, you know, 10 minutes later, they got to put that smile on the face. So you can't, you know, and so those are real things. Uh, you offer counseling for them. Um, yeah. And uh, they're both doing really good. And, um, you know, those are good things that, you know, resources that we have. So they're all offered all those things. Yeah, I think, well, just to follow up, Patrick touched on it, but we offer all employees, we buy an employee assistance program uh, affiliated with the hospitals in Kingston, where whether it be at home marriage counseling to on the job incidents, it doesn't matter. We offer to them all and they're aware of it. And the village taxpayer, it's not a super expensive benefit, but we have it and it's um, well worth it and quite frankly we use the same entity comes in our for our annual sexual harassment workplace safety and we'll probably add some modules you know, if we can because one of the questions will and i came up with okay the cops can go get implicit bias training and these different things but so should everybody probably right so we could offer it to our our staff you know um, because it's our staff doesn't just interact with the public in the form of a police department. It's all levels of interaction. Um, I, I would appreciate it. You know, we're talking about yeah. implicit bias. We're talking yeah, about we, uh, policing. Oh, I would, I would appreciate uh, yeah, we a about, presentation on that, if not a training. Yeah. We normally do it in the January timeframe when it's a little slower, but um, with COVID, we just can't get crowds in here. And uh, <laughs> hopefully when it breaks, we get vaccinations. Um, that's another thing, it's a side story, but the police officers are gonna be in the 1B, 1B tier where they can get the next two weeks or so, uh, they should be getting their first round of COVID shots. So, uh, Cause we've had a few incidents lately, folks, where they've gone into scenarios where there's COVID in the residence and so forth. And one of our poor officers had to isolate for Christmas all by himself. Four times. He, he, he's, that officer's gotten it four times. In the, you know, the last time for Christmas, he had to. It was two days before Christmas, and there was a woman in cardiac arrest, um, and her husband had called 911, but they were COVID positive in the house. You know, and he said to me, he said, I had to go in. It's our job. You know, we, you know, our job is to help people and save people's lives. So he went in, um, uh, and, uh, you know, and obviously we have AEDs. We have trainers in AED. We have trainers in, in Stop the Bleed. You know, Officer Wilson's a trainer in all those things. He trains some people in the school. He's a full-time fireman. And uh, he went in, got exposed. You know, unfortunately, he had to, you know, spend prison by himself. But that's, that's part of what we do. You know, it is, it is what it is. Well, we try, I think we'll wrap up this one in a few minutes. But one thing, some of the conversation about the um, mobile crisis units and so forth, in the book they talk about it a little bit too, but it's what you'll hear different elected officials call unfunded mandates. In other words, um, it's good to talk, talk, but you need the funding. And in a funny way, um, different things the state does, not just with this, but other things in our operation that become requisite upon us to, to perform. Um, we have to somehow come up with the money. And that's why there's that balancing, even in the police redesign and reform work we're doing, we, we have to find that, okay, who can we get as partners to help us, whether it be the county, the town, the school district, <clears throat> you know, what, what can we best, and that's the task of this group, let's pull the five or six most important things first, and then work on the rest later. <clears throat> I think we'll start to wrap up tonight. I know various other board members were quiet, and we did have a public comment piece. Um, we did hear quite a bit from the main stakeholders, um, which we appreciate. But board members first, do you have anything you want to throw in and then we'll go out to public comment? I was, uh, I was very impressed and, and still trying to figure out how we can come up with a vehicle and have those people who are afraid or insecure about speaking to or complaining or logging a complaint, how they can address us somehow. Um, I think Patrick brought up some good ideas, but I'm it's still 
this is one of the things I hope that our stakeholders can help make suggestions that how can we put people at ease to come forward and express their um, fears or if there's some complaint that they have either with our police or with a fellow citizen that we can help them with, how can we best get that message through to us so we can handle it in, in a way that we can help everyone involved. So that, that was very, for me, made my mind roll a little bit trying to figure out how we could do that. Yeah, we've been struggling. Like you suggest, Brent, is a great idea. If the stakeholders from their experience and their lives could come up with something. But I think it should be not just PD, like you're suggesting, Brent, across the culture. Across the culture. One sad thing we discovered in the mural discussions um, were that the one that was taken down on the corner by Yum Yum Noodle, um, certain individuals who grew up in Red Hook, persons of color, um, who are now 28, 30 years old, only now felt enabled or strong enough to come out and talk about what they saw in that artwork. And they first had some of their incidents from what I could develop by talking to them in their adolescent high school years. So it took the BLM movement, certain things that were happening in the past nine months that they felt empowered to come out and talk about it. Um, but that's what we're up against, you know, and that's what this project in the booklet is police oriented, but what Brent is saying for Red Oak as a community, it's something. And we have the stakeholders, RHEDI, which is Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, you know, it's a cool group of folks. I think some of the names I see in the participants are those people. Anybody else from the board? And we have showing here 22 participants. Any public comment, non-stakeholders? Okay. I'll go. Well, thank you. Oh, hey. hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, that's Sarah and Bowden, as I can see. Yeah, I don't know if you all have gallery view on, but hey, everybody, I can see all of you. Um, I just want to thank you for opening this conversation to the public. I know, Pat, you and I have sat across the table from each other several times talking about various policing issues when I was on the town board. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see you talking more about these things and going over the report. And I just wanted to make a couple comments following up on some things we heard tonight. I'm not looking for a response from you. I just want to make the comments. Um, one would be, I do think that the data point is really, it's, it's really critical. You know, as a former town board person, somebody who did push for us to grow our contract with the village because I heard Pat's statements about the need for a more equitable share of the town taking on policing costs. Um, it's hard to make those choices and to help give the police feedback on that coverage when you don't have data to look at um, that, that helps understand the, the full scope of, of what the interactions the public are having with police. And specifically, I'm talking about that demographic data. As a town board member, I saw the same reports that you all as village board members see. So I'm not talking about the addresses and that kind of thing. So that's one thing is just, I do think the comments that Kahan in particular made about data, the point is that like a body camera, they protect or protect, they, they tell the story in a neutral way that actually helps the village, it helps the town, it helps the police, and it helps the public all understand better what's going on. So that's one thing I'm really looking forward as you unpack that further to hearing how, how you see that moving forward. And the other thing is I am curious how you see that conversation with the town moving forward as far as town village control over the police how to see that coverage uh, ratio change. Because I, I hear what you're saying, Pat, and I think we've all heard it over the years. It's not just the, it's the mental health and the public safety, most important. It's all this, things like dog control and all kinds of other things that you all end up being that, that phone call, right? When people are in an emergency situation and it's just not fair, right? It's not fair to expect you all to just take that on without a reflection of that in the town's budget as well as the, you know, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that also. 
Good, thank you. Yeah, I made one of my notes here is data, like from a couple different conversations from tonight. I'm looking over even from, let's see, the September 26 notes I made, let's see. Oh, so Amy Smith wants to speak. Yeah, and Lauren and Terry, Lauren had her hand up first, so I'll okay, go after Lauren. Lauren. Hey, I'm not a super hand up noticer, so okay. I'm not ignoring anybody. Um, I'm looking well, at my, sorry, just if, if don't feel insulted, I'm not seeing hands up to be honest with you. So just okay, say, I'll just start talking then. Okay. Um, hi. Um, so I just have like a couple points that I wanted to bring up. Um, sure. I think overall, just like a general theme of transparency with the police force is really important to me. Um, like this issue with the budget, for example, I was able to find that there is a budget for the town that shows that $62,000 goes to Red Hook Police Protection, but I haven't been able to find any kind of information regarding a budget from the village. So if there could be, once you guys kind of go through this process, I think highlighting a budget that is specific to the police force that then is available to the public would be really beneficial in giving us an idea handling so much of that budget for the police force that, that more of it is not going to the town. Um, additionally, I think understanding who is um, policing our community would be, I'm sorry, I'm getting very nervous. <clears throat> Okay. Take your time. We don't, we don't notice it. You sound good. Go. Okay, good. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Keep going. <laughs> All right. So, um, like, I tried to find that information online, who the police force is and what their names are. I wasn't able to find this on the village website, so I emailed the mayor. Um, I actually never heard back about that question. Um, I think that to have positive police culture, um, as the county report underscores, the police must have a relationship with the community in which they serve. I live in the village and I've actually never seen a police officer on foot. Um, so I'd like to see active steps taken to address this issue. Um, and and then, yeah, I think that's most of it. Did you have anything? Okay, those well, are my two main points. This like general transparency. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Just one thought. I can tell you, I don't recall seeing an email from you on that last point you mentioned about okay. the roster of PD. So I would not ignore an email from you. So uh, if you want to resend it or whatever. Um, well, I think just knowing who the police are that polices community, it's important to have that information available to the public. The fact that I didn't know that I, I don't know who the names of all of our police officers are is a problem. Hmm. Well, there are a bunch of friendly sorts, but e email me what you're talking about because I don't want any misperception <laughs> from uh, ignoring your emails, and I don't do that. So, um, okay. We made some notes on your other thoughts and comments, and I know we're always available. You know, so, you um, could I call me, sit, talk, whatever. Um, okay, I'm just, you can't see me raising my hand, maybe. I'm just gonna, if you don't mind. No, um, I just had a question. So, um, and it doesn't need an answer either. Um, like Sarah in Bowdoin, it can just be a, a question slash comment. Um, I 100%, uh, since I work in, in a public where we deal with civil service all the time, I am 100% sensitive to the challenges of dealing with the civil service system and its limitations, et cetera. Um, so my question is, um, we heard you both talking about uh, one officer in particular, but I'm sure this is true of many of the part-time officers. When Pat has invested time and expertise in an officer and training has been given and all this other stuff, and it's someone the community is also um, really excited about, um, is it a question of money um, that prevents us from taking a part-time officer who would want to stay here if we had a full-time job for them um, and making them full or are there other considerations? Why, um, and I, like I said, I get civil service. So if that's part of the answer, um, I'm not sure everybody knows how civil service can be such a problem, but what is it um, that if we have officers who would like to stay in Red Hook, because that's also a financial and a budget issue, right? Pat's time is not, um, 
and nor are uh, any of those trainings. So if someone wants to stay and we're doing a great job of helping them become better officers, can we keep them? Oh, I'll answer that question real quick. I can throw in something, but there's two components. Patrick, you go first. Okay. Yeah. Let me chime in real quick. So it's, it's a good question and it happens, we'll say from, I, I use us for example, obviously, because I manage with part-time officers, but it happens a lot in bigger agencies, Dutch County Sheriff's Office, City of Poughkeepsie, we heard it on the forum, the chief of the city of Poughkeepsie came on and said it's really hard to keep officers and retention is one of the biggest things that we discuss. And we've brought it up in, in, um, in Dutchess County Chiefs Association meeting, which I'm a part of, is the retention of our officers. The problem is, you know, the city of Poughkeepsie, I think that next year they could potentially have 25 plus people openings, retirees and transfers out. And what happens is, is the, how it works is the further you go south, the more money you make. So people who live in city of Poughkeepsie, they might live in Beacon, you know, work in that area, they can drive 45 minutes south and walk in the door $30,000 more a year to start. So we would all do that. So every agency, big and small, for me, it's part-timers. They go part-time to full-time. And, and, and honestly, I support them and I help them get those full-time jobs because I know how good they are. My, uh, my question is, can we make a part-timer who wants to stay, knowing they will make less than if they were in peak skill, can we make them full time? That's that's my. I don't I don't question any of the what you okay. just said. I'll Go jump ahead. in. I'll jump in. You can fill me in. Um, essentially, no. The problem: a part timer does not have to come off a tested list. We can hire part timers. We have an allocation from civil service. I believe it's three full time slots, and then we have as many part times as we can get. Um, so the catch twenty two is. The civil service say we have a wonderful candidate and this is how we've got our full timers to be honest with you but then we run out of slots you have to play the top three game patrick has a little more on this but mm -hmm. essentially hiring public employees for full-time jobs you need to pull from a civil service test list you right. pull, pull the highest scoring people there's a lot of bad ne negatives with that they could be somebody from beacon who's not going to even want to drive to red oak to make you know x thousand dollars a year um so we are precluded or blocked from moving up our people automatically. We've got around it once or twice, you know, like we're, you have to go through a list of three, you know, it's just a whole process with civil but service. But they were in the top three. Yeah, and um, the bottom side is, what we talked about before, budget. Um, Part-timers are relatively well paid, but they do not get in the union contract and the way we work any of the quote benefits. We don't buy health insurance and essentially, Right now, we're in a tax cap world. We, this year coming up, we have a 1.31% ability to raise taxes, which is essentially zero in the world of what we do. Um, would you, if your boss told you, well, you're gonna get a 1% raise, you know, it's, and so to move anybody from part-time to full-time, it's an immediate jump. If, you, if it's a family person, the medical bang for us is about $30,000 for a full family. If it's a single person, it's about $15,000 over and above, and then you have, some other ancillary things, um, you know, you have the benefit time, meaning vacation time, where you're covering. So we're, it's a tough spot. And that's one of our things. And it's a big picture question, which I kick around a lot. A big department has a chief, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, staffers, little guys, you know, admin people, dispatchers. We are like working with a very small, talented crew. And that's one reason. I do all that. Maybe to go. What's that? I do all that. <laughs> nah, a few guys help you, including me. But um, it's, uh, you know, if we went to the town, would you be able to say, and on Lauren's question, the budget, we're now moving into our budget season. Uh, the budget is about 30% of our operating general fund budget. Um, it's a big chunk of money. And we've always felt, though, that the Guardian nature, what they do, they're a hybrid of... EMS, ambulance, fire. Patrick's been at fires before fire companies have been at fires. You know, it's um, it's something. Maybe we shouldn't call them <laughs> police. Yeah, you know, maybe there's some other name, a modern name, <coughs> um, something. Uh, they do a lot more than just run out and do law enforcement. Um, and it's a question for the public and the board of trustees. You know. And it's been an ongoing one. How much can we afford and how long can we? And um, what's the option? 
you know, as a, a real business perspective, if you look at Tivoli, they contract out their police protection. They essentially pay way more per wage hour than we pay to get the services that they don't really get to control. Part of our perspective so far has been we can still work with, manage, and control our PD. If you go away, if you go out of the PD business and you're hiring it out, you don't know what you're getting. You're the whim and the fancy of whoever you're contracting with. And we're still in a pretty rural section of the county where there's not a lot of police protection up here anyway on a, you know, from state police or sheriff's office. And that's never been one of my perspectives or goals. Um, that's why I look toward the town, what, what can be created in a bigger picture someday with the town. But I think it's at that two hour mark, which gets to be the point where I think any meeting has to end. Um, we're gonna do another workshop 21 January if my calendar in my head is correct. And you have another person who's had her hand up. Oh, really? Where's yeah. the hands? Hi. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna be short um, okay. because the, what I had um, planned on saying has already been addressed quite a bit, but I do have a little bit to add. Sure. Could you say who you are, please? Sorry, my name is Melody Narvaez, and I live in the village. Oh, hello. Okay. Hi. Um, so going off of the, one of the first, one of the early things that was talked about, the no reports, no, there are no incidents. We don't know that there are any incidents because there are no reports. Um, you know, obviously, we, what was talked about was that the police need to be trusted. Um, and I think it's really easy to believe that you have a good rapport with the community when the only people you interact with have a good rapport with you. Um, do you know what I mean? <laughs> or the, the only people that, you know, so um, I, I wanna encourage some thought about how we could reach out to all of the community or how the police could reach out to all the community um, because it won't work to lay the responsibility on their doorstep you, you know just to say you can trust us please come to us so of course um, some of the things um, to consider would be their interactions with um, for you know black and brown people in our community but also um public interactions with other people like um how would someone feel about trusting the police when the interactions that they see from afar or outside are ones of commiseration with those who freely express prejudice in our community um, and those who openly hate on places like Bard. Um, there's even a group that on Facebook that's all about how terrible um, local government is um, and we need to get the Dems out and stuff like that. So, and then there's also, um, you know, people, people who have uh, moved here from, from any distance away are often called cityots. Um, I'm sure you're, a lot of people have seen. So well, with that kind of culture in the town, you know, and then with the whole Trump parades that went through, um, there's, there's this, um, they've got their blue lives flags and they're pointing, they're like, those are our guys, you know, though, and they have this, um, and I understand it's, it's easy to respond positively to people who appear to be supporting you, but at the same time, what message is that sending? Like, you know, people are going, they're, they're going through town, they're revving their engines, they're squealing their tires, and then they're waving to officers, to police cars, hey, you know, because we support you, but they've also got um, floor mats taped over their license plates. They've got unsecured flagpoles hanging out, and obviously the election is over, and so this is done. But um, hopefully it's done. I mean, who knows? But I mean, um, and then I saw a video of a woman who was trying, to, who was very harassed at the rec park, and um, they were just dancing around her, making fun of her while she was trying to speak to the officer. So what is her like to be very specific what is her motivation to go in the future to report an incident like this when it was easily dismissed 
and they just literally made fun of. They have videos on the internet of her. They made a gif out of her um, because she moved in a way that they thought was funny to repeat over and over. So that's <laughs> obviously not something that I'm asking to be answered, but I, I, I wanted to add that to the consideration. A good rapport with everyone in the community. Um, I wanted to add that to the equation. Consider not only how you're treating the people that you meet, but how you're treating how how your public interactions are in the community. And okay, I don't know how to end it, but I'm not looking for an answer for well, sure. Think, I'm just laying that out there. <laughs> I think two things. One is um, our underlying premise and operating principle is. The police should not be politicized or the political wing of any party, Democrat, Republican, Trumpism. Um, they know that message. You know, we don't um, we don't condone any like internal politics expressions in their day to day job. What they do in their own personal life, that's their call. Um, we saw incredible ugliness yesterday in Washington, D.C. We saw a variation of it here. Um, but in government, we were prepared if something ended in the village. Um, the two incidents I know of ended in the town park, and we did reach out and RPD. They were not there as part of it to condone it or anything. It was a public safety issue. What videos construed or conveyed, I, you know, I saw one. I don't know what you're all talking about, what, if other people did something else. But, um, but our message to RPD is they're professionals. They're trained. They're skilled at what they do. Um, we don't expect them to have one proclivity for one political stance or another. It's, uh, and that, that's their directive from us as a village board and the mayor. So uh, the other thing, I think it's a societal, societal cultural thing. And, you know, in, well, I don't really want to get into the politics of it right now. <laughs> we could have a separate discussion, but um, we, we believe in moving ahead and moving forward and 2021 has got to be better than 2020. But um, anyway, folks, I'd like to call it a night. Um, Usually we have Mr. Kovacek, the deputy mayor, who reigns in the meetings at the end as a custom. Jennifer Norris has been quiet. And Charlie, you good? You out there? Yeah. Um, um, I see them. She's muted. But Brent, you want to make a motion and we wrap it up tonight? I can make a motion that we adjourn this evening's meeting. I'd just like to, to thank all the people who participated. It's very informative and um, we give us a lot of food for thought. I hope we can move forward in a real positive way. So again, I make a motion that we adjourn this evening's meeting. Anybody Second. Thinking? All right. I won't do a roll call, but all in favor and good night. Thanks to everybody. We talk on 21 or 11 January. Okay. Take care. Thank you.